And now that we're recording again, uh, welcome again to our conference. And uh, we're delighted to uh, have uh, Dr. Daniel Wilkenfeld from Pittsburgh uh, in the nursing school uh, talk to us about simply understanding the world, patterns and compression. Before I give the word to Daniel, I should say that um, um, my um, um, being alive to the variety of epistemic desiderata that understanding might uh, activate or sometimes even presume um, uh, is a direct consequence of reading Daniel's work. And I'm very grateful for that. And his uh, multiply, uh, multiple, multiply dimensional approach to understanding is, uh, has been incredibly helpful for me in that. And um, I'm eager to see uh, what he's going to uh, say about patterns and compression and about simply understanding the world. Thanks so much, Daniel, and please take it away. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, so I did a version of this at the Center of Philosophy of Science lunchtime talk a little back, and it's since come out in Phil's studies. Um, but this is, I wanna talk about my current view of understanding. And before I get started, one of the things I'm always interested in is sort of the depth and the ways we really come to appreciate things in the world other than just scientific phenomena. Scientific phenomena are awesome. I think they're exhilarating to look at, but I also think there's so much more to the world that like a theory of understanding could capture. So I'm gonna try and play a video here and you'll see why in a second, even though I don't have much time, I think this is worth it. We met a few days ago. I, I asked you about the church and the verse. Oh, yes. Glad to found? help. You were nice about my tie. Yes. And today is another cracker, if I may say so. But I just wondered, between you and me, in a uh, hundred words, where do you think Van Gogh rates in the history of art? Well, um, big question. Um, but to me, Van Gogh is the finest painter of the world certainly the most popular great painter of all time, the most beloved, his command of color, the most magnificent. He transformed the pain of his tormented life into ecstatic beauty. Pain is easy to portray, but to use your passion and pain to portray the ecstasy and joy and magnificence of our world, no one had ever done it before. Perhaps no one ever will again. To my mind, that strange, wild man. Uh, can't figure out how to get to the next slide. Um, okay, cool. So I really like that clip. I feel like I've always loved this painting, but there was an extent to which I never really appreciated exactly what was going on as far as capturing Van Gogh's extreme depression and translating it into beauty. And that somehow learning that little nugget about the painter really changed what I could conclude about the painting, what I could think about the painting in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, so that's sort of my introductory spiel. Um, in order to, sort, to establish what I want from an account of understanding, just methodologically, what I like to do first is just look at some mostly natural language sentences about understanding. So here are just, I think I have eight sentences. Um, Daniel understands a proof of the soundness of a natural deduction system of first order logic. Um, I might not be able to see all these because my face is blocking some. Um, the, a publication of a wealth of nations greatly increased people's understanding of the behaviors of markets. Um, I understand the painting, The Starry Night. Um, I understand the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Uh, we'll see in a little while why that one's special. I understand why Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. I'm going to argue that four and five don't mean the same thing, um, even though sometimes they might be taken to be the same. Um, here's a more, here's as classic a case as you could want. I understand the ideal gas law. Um, you might think that understanding should apply not just to phenomena, but also to people. And for those of you steeped in the continental tradition, this might seem apocryphal or heretical that um, I would lump these two together, but I think they should go together. 
or I could just talk about me understanding people generally. Um, and what I want to note is that it's not that all these sentences are true relative to any particular context of assessment. Some of these sentences will come out just at least intuitively true and some of them false, but relative to other contexts of assessment, different ones might come out true or false. Uh, the exception here is number eight, which is always false. People are confusing and I don't understand them, but the rest of them could all be true or false in different contexts. Okay, so here's my plan of attack. I wanna lay out my methodology for how I'm gonna build up the account and then I'm actually gonna build it. Um, I'm gonna answer some obvious concerns about the account. I'm gonna point out some of its nice features and my guess is I'm gonna run out of time, but if I can, I'll compare it to some other accounts. Um, if I do, that'll probably be a sign I was talking too fast. Um, okay, so here's my methodology. So first I wanna try to get an account that's as clear as possible and achieves the best balance of the following desiderata. So I wanna correctly classify philosophers, paradigmatic judgments of understanding. Um, most traditionally in this literature, I wanna classify judgments of understanding in the history of science. Um, following on work on people, especially like Duncan Pritchard, I think it's important to shed light on why understanding would be a valuable concept. I'm using bold here to indicate that it's a concept term. Um, I wanted to accord with folk intuitions about the application of the term understanding. That's why I just started with some typical natural language sentences. Um, and I'd like people to read the account as much as they did in my 2013. And so far that is not happening. I am utterly baffled by know why this one's not as popular, but I think it's cool. Um, so here's what I'm gonna talk about. My main example is going to be understanding soundness of a natural logic system. Um, so I'm gonna guess most people in this virtual room probably understand the soundness proof of some system of natural deduction. Maybe not, but I'm guessing most of you do. But okay, here's a challenge for all of you right now. Recite a proof of the soundness of that natural deduction system and go now. Um, here's the thing. So some of my students around the time of their first midterm could pass this challenge. I'd say, prove, prove soundness, go. And they would do it. Um, I don't think I could. Um, I could come close, but I would have to stop and think. I couldn't just rattle it off. And I think that's going to be the crucially important point, that stopping and thinking has a lot to do with understanding. And in fact, I'm going to maintain that I understand the proof, and at least some of them don't. Um, and the key is that having a soundness proof memorized is unnecessary for understanding the proof or soundness. And I'm going to argue it's superfluous relative to genuinely understanding the proof. Okay, so I can't just rattle it off. So how do I prove soundness? I mean, I can. Um, so I have a few explicitly remembered facts. I remember, you know, the syntactic form of the rules in the system. I could rattle off disjunction elimination pretty easily. Um, I remember some general strategies for proving the soundness of a rule, something like using strong induction. Um, and then I could just fill in the schema of the general form. It kind of goes on like that. And because I understand, I don't need to have it memorized. I can just keep going the way I've been going. And moreover, because I don't just have it memorized, I can actually do more with proofs like it. Um, and here's sort of my central claim, being in a state where I have a representational kernel and an ability to piece together the rest is not just a result of understanding, but what it means to understand. This is what I think understanding is really mostly all about. Uh, one thing I'm going to flag, and I don't remember since I can't see my notes where the best place to flag it is, uh, as soon as I talk about you know, just going on like that, a lot of you might have like warning lights about Wittgensteinian concerns. Uh, I will very briefly touch on those later, but I'm not going to solve those. Like if you're concerned that about, you know, philosophical investigations, then we have bigger problems right now than trying to figure out what understanding amounts to, like everything we think we know is wrong. So my apologies for using, apologies for using something like it goes on like that, just bracket your Wittgensteinian concerns for the moment. Um, oh, here by the way is an anecdote that I love. Um, a logic professor of mine, I think it was Neil Tennant. Um, I don't know if, I assume this is apocryphal, once told me that Gödel, upon reading Cohen's proof uh, that there was no way to establish or disprove the continuum hypothesis, got to the end of the section of definitions, especially the definition of forcing, and just cast aside the proof with an uh, exclamation of, well, obviously then. 
um, that once he saw the beginning and knew how to do basic proof construct, well, not basic proof construction, fairly elaborate proof construction, he could just see how it would go from there. And I argue that he actually understood the proof that he hadn't even finished reading yet because he had the relevant criteria, um, nature the element of understanding, which is the representational kernel and being able to do something with it. Okay, so I'd like to build up my account a little bit from the ground up. Um, uh, once again, the zoom bar is blocking what I want to say. So let's talk about first what we understand. Um, sorry. So at the sentences at the start we're supposed to exhibit, we understand a lot of different kinds of things propositions, reasons, events, laws, idealized laws. I want to talk about people and paintings and states of affairs. I think this is crucial. I'm actually giving another talk in about a week about why I think this is crucial, that it's in particular not even just explanations. It's just we understand a lot of stuff. Um, and so I want to try to be as general as possible. So I'm just going to use the word objects. Um, I'm kind of borrowing this very roughly from Quine when he talks about anything we can objectually quantify over. Um, if we can, uh, if it can fall under an objectual quantifier, I say we can understand it, probably. Okay, um, so whose and what understanding do we care about? Um, and I'm going to argue that first and foremost, what we care about is understanding in human persons. And in fact, if you look at those first eight sentences, all of them were about understanding of one human person, uh, except for the one about wealth of nations, which was understanding in people generally. Um, the second thing is they all think, have to do with how we think about the world. So it's people thinking about the world. So my assumption is that understanding is, in its primary sense, a cognitive state of human persons, one or more. Now, I think it does make sense to talk about computers or dogs understanding, but I think usually the criteria for evaluating those claims is how they stack up to what we think of as paradigmatic human understanding. And obviously, like, taken to the extreme, this is where you get the Turing test, like, can it fool you into thinking it is human? That's how you know it understands or can think in that case. Okay, so building up the account a little more, let's talk about more useful output. Um, so in cases where the potential output isn't limited, um, not just proof, this particular proof, but proofs generally, I think being able to generate more information seems to constitute typically more understanding. Now, intuitively, not any information counts. Um, if I could tell you more about the font of a logic book, that doesn't help my understanding in most contexts that we care about at all. Uh, so we need to be able to generate contextually useful consequences. And you can see some shades of direct here already. Um, I mean, obviously, as you know, there's nothing new under the sun. A lot of this is borrowed from a lot of people. Um, so. Okay, I want to say that you need to be able to generate useful understanding. So here is my slide that contains my official count of usefulness. Okay, we're good. Let's move on. So I then want to talk about building up an account in terms of less input, but you might want to me to say more about usefulness because that was cheating. So I will say a little bit more. And all I'm going to say, or what I'm mostly going to say is that it's heavily dependent on context and who is in those contexts. Um, I think it might have something to do with helping achieve ends that are constitutive and of an activity in question. And Hasak Chang has an amazing article in 2009 on MS epistemic activities that I think could potentially be marshaled to form an account of usefulness. I haven't done so, but I think it would be cool. Um, but as is often the case, I think we typically know what's useful when we see it. And we'll see how it varies by context. So these are just some context. Here's what's useful to generate. Here's what's less. And what should come out very obviously is how things can flip. So in the physics lab, it's good to be able to generate a solution to a partial differential equation. Probably not as crucial if it's a theoretical physics lab to know about you know, the Brooklyn Bridge. If you're building a bridge, information about bridges, super helpful. Solution to partial differential equations may be useful, but probably less so. If you're parenting, then how will my child respond to this book and this pretty picture? Really good to know. How is what's going on in their brains as far as processing the visual images? Totally useless. Conversely, neuroscience lab, want to know how they're processing the visual images? Care significantly less, you know, does this make my child happy? And the current case in a logic class, 
being able to generate a soundness proof is probably understanding constitutive in some cases. Information in the book, found, book fonts is not, but notice even that could be reversed. If this is a typesetting class, then if I happen to be using a logic book as my example, then information, being able to generate information about how to create new book fonts is potentially understanding conferring, whereas the actual content, the soundness proof, might be completely irrelevant. Okay, so continuing going with our building up the account from mostly scratch. Um, so I said more output is good. It's defined by contextually useful information. So now let's talk about less input. Um, so looking at the logic class, I would under argue that I understand better, and this is going to be a scalar notion, because I get by with less. So, and here's an instrument. I think that's intrinsically good. But I think there are also lots of instrumental reasons that's important. One is that if they forget, if my students forget part of the proof, they're done. Um, I don't have that problem. If I forget, if I forget the exact steps for proving that you know disjunction elimination uh, preserves truth, uh, I'm probably okay. I'll be able to fix it. Um, I could, of course, also have part of the proof memorized. But that's consistent with the fact that I would be fine if I forgot part. OK, here's where I mentioned I wasn't sure what to make of what Kareem says. I said I would call him a realist, but I'm not going to really, which is should understanding have an accurate requ accuracy requirement? And this gets into the debate that we talked about that was talked about earlier. Um, one, here's an intuition. Uh, phlogiston theorists did not understand combustion. Kareem, as I understand him, says they understood lots of other interesting things. but Combustion is not one of them. Um, Direct and his colleagues frequently say that, no, at least to some extent, they did understand combustion because they could do all sorts of cool things, even if it was based on various false beliefs. OK, so we have these conflicting intuitions. What can we do about it? Uh, well, right now, notice I haven't, when I was defining you need to be able to get more output out of less input, said anything about accuracy. I could just go with that and leave it the way it is. Um, I could go with Kareem, who I think is, to my mind, in the majority here. Um, I shouldn't say everyone else in the world, given this audience, but many people in the world that, look, understanding requires some degree of accuracy. Um, I could they say, and this is an idea I got from Colin Allen, that understanding is sometimes used as a success term and sometimes not, um, and we know lots of terms like that. Or I could hedge a bunch. What I'm actually going to do is mostly agree with Kareem, but I'm going to hedge some. But honestly, I could be talked out of this. It's been two years since eh, I'm feeling pretty good about it. So taking all of that together, build it up, what do we end up with? So this is, again, I got this has since come out in Phil's studies. Um, a person P understands object O in context C to the extent that they have a representation process pair that could generate more useful as determined by C, information about O from an accurate, more compressed representation. So I am requiring some accuracy. Uh, I'm not going to say how the trade-off between accuracy and uh, productivity is affected. I have another article um, where I say basically this is just multidimensional, um, and that's fine. There's just two axes of evaluation. I think it's basically multiplicative. This is just my intuition. I'm not going to defend it. If you're totally inaccurate. If there's nothing accurate in your um, exponents, then I think you have a very serious problem. If it's totally useless, I think you have a very serious problem. Anywhere in between, I think, I don't know how that trade-off's affected. OK. And again, this is the scalar version. If you want to get from, this talks about understanding something to an extent. If you want to just talk about understanding outright, I think you need a contextualist semantics, probably. Um, what counts as understanding in this context? What counts as enough? Christoph Kelp in his 2015 article has a really good um, description of this that I think we can just go with. Um, okay, so what does any of this have to do with compression? Um, so the central idea of my account is that we really, what we really possess when we understand a proof is a representation of the essential points, along with a process that tells our mind how to fill in the rest of the results based on pre-existing information about the system of which the proof is a part. And I think if you put it that way, hopefully this the idea that compression is relevant might be becoming manifest. So just take the simplest possible example of compression. Suppose you have a picture file. 
you're not going to probably encode any pricks, any every pixel. If you have two non-adjacent pixels that are the same shade of red, um, you can encode a large swath of information by saying, look, this point's red, that point's red, everything in between just kind of goes on like that. Um, and my claim is that you could do the same for the soundness proof. Uh, you have certain facts about how the proof is structured and a general mathematical knowledge about the system to just say, and you know, it goes on like that. Um, so looking at my account, which is you see, um, the picture is that the better we compress useful information, the better we understand. Um, note that this understanding could be either complete. So I can completely understand maybe a soundness proof. It could definitely be partial as in the case of understanding my daughter. Um, I think this actually loosely corresponds to lossless compression. I mean, I've compressed everything about the soundness proof and extremely lossy compression. I've lost a lot of information about my daughter by trying to remember certain things and not keeping track of everything. Okay, so where can we talk more about compression? And I'm always um, anxious to give props to XKCD and Randall Monroe. So here's something from one of his columns about how compression works. Um, so imagine you have a language with only two sentences and every tweet must be one of those sentences. What are they? There's a horse in aisle five and my house is full of traps. And then Twitter would look a lot like this. You just have sequences of those sentences over and over. And here's this nice summary of how compression works. I think really captures a really great idea, which is that the messages are long, but there's not a lot of information in each one. All they tell you is whether the person decided to send the trap message or the horse message. So it's basically either a zero or a one. And even though there are a lot of letters, the key is if you know the pattern, then there's only one bit of information which is, he says, a very deep idea, which I think he's right, which is that information is fundamentally tied to the recipient's uncertainty about the message's content and their ability to predict it in advance, which I would say is further governed by how much they know about the system. Okay, um, so what we are interested in was a way to construct an account of understanding in terms of the minimal information required, like, Here's the set of possible tweets. It's one of these two. Okay, this one starts with a T, that one starts with an M to recreate the maximum information possible, which this way, in this case, we can do completely with the full sequence of someone's Twitter timeline. Okay, there are lots of different ways to categorize compression. This is not something I know as much about as I should, but it turns out not to matter so much because a lot of them get similar results. Um, I think our desiderata for an account of understanding underdetermined whether there's like the one holy true count of compression. Uh, but one that seems to do the job that I like is minimal description length. Um, so here, when we talk about minimal input, what you're inputting is just the length of the description of the hypothesis. So say that it's one of these two tweets about that's the hypothesis about how the data are structured. And then a description of the data in terms of that hypothesis. So just sentences like this one starts with a T, this one starts with an M, or even just T, M. Um, and then you just minimize the length of those two things. Um, what I like about this is that it turns out not to matter so much what language you chose, which might seem counterintuitive, that as long as it's a sufficiently rich expressive language, um, you'll get pretty similar results to what's a minimal description length. So here's a slightly fleshed out version of understanding as compression in terms of minimal description length. Uh, a person P understands object O in context C to the extent that they have an accurate representation process pair that can generate more useful as determined again in C information about O from an accurate shorter description length. Okay, there's the account, done, built it. Let's take a nap. Okay, well, there are concerns. Um, you might be worried first about compression that doesn't aid understanding. So one worry, and I think this is a real one, if there happen to be a string of symbols in a proof, remembering a quick rule for those symbols and memorizing the remainder by brute force would not seem to aid understanding. And I am a little worried about this. But how big a problem is it really for people? Um, so do we really encode proofs that way? And I think usually not. I mean, memorizing a syntactic pattern of symbol strings is a fine, in the middle of a proof, is a fine way for a computer to encode a proof. But it would be a very weird way for a person to do so. Uh, and more importantly, to the extent that the pattern was accidentally 
related to the target object, the understanding would be fairly limited because it wouldn't generate a new case. So maybe you get very, very, very limited understanding, but you wouldn't do much. And it probably wouldn't meet the contextual threshold for outright understanding, which might be driving the intuition that it's totally worthless. And notice that it isn't accidentally related. If there's a reason the symbols come in the order they do, then all of a sudden you do start to get something that's real understanding. If it's tracking something real about the object. So if I think if I'm doing a proof and all I remember, here's the trick I'm using. The next symbol in a broad sense of symbol is disproportionately likely to be pick an arbitrary variable assignment. Um, that could be a good way to generate a proof, but it also says something about the proof in a way that I think aids my understanding. Um, okay, um, that'd be for predicate logic, obviously. So understanding, you might worry, okay, that's, there's compression without understanding. What about understanding without compression? Um, I can have relatively simple understanding of why an event happens by just knowing some facts about its causal history, even if none of the information is relevantly compressed. So for example, my four-year-old son understands why I was late from work today when I say that a meeting ran long, even without any other information and know this, he didn't compress anything. But does he really understand? Well, probably, maybe. So he knows why I'm late, but does he really understand it? I'm not so sure. Um, so one challenge for any theory of understanding is to say where, even if you think understanding is a kind of knowledge, it's presumably not just any knowledge. So you have to say where mere knowledge ends and understanding begins. Uh, so let's compare my four-year-old to my spouse who's been stuck in meetings before and can generate information about the sort of things that can make readings run late, the sorts of feelings I might've had during the meetings. Um, so I think she understands my lateness. My son can report a simple fact. Now, I think this actually draws the line in just about the right way. My son doesn't understand and she does. But for now, since I'm just responding to an objection, I think it suffices that I don't think it obviously draws the line in the wrong place to say that he's at missing understanding and she has it. I think that's at least not a devastating objection. Okay, here's an objection. I think this comes from Colin Allen also, um, but I can't remember for sure, which is that this compression is just an epicycle. It's not doing any useful work because couldn't we boil down everything I've said to the following view? Um, really what understanding is, is just useful knowledge. You understand to the extent that you have useful knowledge. Okay, first issue, I don't like knowledge talk. And so for those of you who know, I don't think she's here. Allison Hills' work on defeaters. Um, it seems like you can have understanding even if there are defeaters that would erode your justification and undercut your knowledge. So I think her example is if your history teacher tells you Napoleon was a bad general, you no longer know that he was a good general, even if you understand everything about him. Um, and I think Hills is right on this. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I had the same idea in 2015 and didn't think to publish it, but uh, I think she's right. Okay, so forget knowledge. Let's just tweak it a little, that should be fine. So one understands to the extent that one has useful representations. Well, maybe, but representations by themselves don't do anything. So this is just super common place in cognitive science, like representations don't read themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. You need some sort of decoding process. Um, okay, so we'll tweak that a little. Here's version number three. You understand to the extent that you have useful representation process pairs. Okay, that's getting close. That sounds pretty plausible, um, but does it show how you generate use understanding to generate like you can in the knowledge class. So I would tweak that just a little bit more to say that here's a different view based on what we started with that you understand to the extent that you have useful representation process pairs and they can generate information. Okay, that's getting really close, but how much information can you generate? Like, it seems like once you, it's important to generate, like wouldn't generating more be better or at least wouldn't the ratio be important? And then once you throw that in, you basically re-establish the importance of compression. So we started off with this sort of much simplified view, but when we actually got into the details of tweaking it, um, we ended up basically with the view I'm saying we should have started with all along. Um, and then since we're basically talking about ratios of information you have to what you could generate, you're pretty much in the ballpark of compression anyways, we might as well use a tool we have lying around from other sources. 
um, very, very rough thematic analogy in philosophy of science. So when Heisenberg wanted to do certain uh, manipulations and it turned out, hey, there's matrix algebra lying around, let's use it. Um, same idea here, like, hey, we have, we want to capture something relatively complex. We have this notion of compression that's fairly well quantified and fairly well accounted for. Let's, let's just use it. Okay, um, here's another objection about understanding and compression as compression and good memories. Like, wouldn't having a good memory mean you understand less? And this actually ties in really nicely, segueing to some of the questions on the last talk. Um, I don't think this is a real worry. I think you can have a good memory and have stuff memorized um, because you can have compressed representations with uncompressed ones and you can have the ability to recreate information even if theoretically you had it. So again, this ties in really nicely. So you could have the multiplication tables memorized but you could also generate them by iterating addition. Um, and incidentally, I thought this was a totally hypothetical example. Uh, I just found out a couple months ago that Kevin Zellman who uh, has forgotten more math than I ever knew, really did when he was younger, refused to memorize the multiplication tables because he said he could just iterate addition. So this can be done. Um, and he understood multiplication and I think I understood multiplication. Um, and interestingly, remembering some things can help you understand some more complicated things. So compare um, once you have the multiplication tables memorized, you can use that to engage in more sophisticated algebraic manipulation. Um, okay, well, what about computers? Don't the fact that people use, uh, who need calculators show they don't understand because um, they're not actually generating the information themselves. And I wanna argue that someone who's using a calculator uh, typically has at least three things, all of which are retained under understanding and compression and sort of map onto other accounts. So first of all, they understand the kind of results that theory should predict, even if they can't compute the result in advance. And what's nice about that is it falls directly out of direct and direct and deeks um, on what understanding really amounts to. Um, I think they understand the theory well enough. They can use the computational aid to get a precise result. So they understand the theory. The, fact, the very fact that they know how to use the calculator in this case shows that they understand. Um, and if you think about a scientist with a broken computer, they still understand because they could have used a computer if it were working. Um, and they can also understand in virtue of remembering their past calculations. So they understood some before they clicked the execute command and they saw this cool data and they understood better. And sure, they couldn't you know, run SPSS in their heads, but they remember what the graph looks like and now they understand even better and that's all okay. Um, so again, not sure what our timing is like because we started a couple minutes late, but so understanding something like a soundness proof. So here's bad understanding, my friend. This is a real example. Actually, when I first told this, I think it was to Kareem, he didn't believe me. I had a friend who memorized the soundness proof for first order logic using the Sheffer stroke. Um, I don't think that was great. Um, if there had been even the slightest like typo or write, writing mistake in his, or in his memory, he would have just been completely lost. What's funny is he definitely could have understood it. He just chose not to on principle because he thought this would be easier. Um, slightly better understanding is what a student we would hope actually has. They remember key points about the rules and how to prove satisfaction. Um, and of course you could take it up a notch. I studied under Stuart Shapiro uh, who understood not just the rules but why they have the structure in the first place um, is an expert on general proofs by strong induction. Uh, so we have the scale of understanding from maybe not at all to okay to yeah, he really understands a soundness proof. Um, the invisible hand of the market, going back to Adam Smith, um, maybe you memorize the book, but you can't really generate any new information. Here's what I think is potentially more interesting. You could have better understanding, which says, look, supply plus demand will give you good results. But if you actually read the book, you could also get better understanding like Adam Smith himself seemed to have, which is that supply plus demand was good until you get to monopolies, then things go bad. And going back to the example with which I started. So maybe if you wanna understand Van Gogh, you memorize a few paintings. Better, but still fairly trivial in this case, understanding. Um, you represent that there's a lot of yellow and generate patterns of paintings based on that. Uh, I had this in the notes, I forget the details. He had some sort of digitalis overdose, underdose, they think that led to more yellow, him seeing more yellow. 
But if you really want better understanding, obviously you go to a British science fiction show um, and realize that you represent him as translating pain to joy and generate patterns of paintings, the role of the paintings, et cetera. Um, again, don't know exactly what the timeline's like here, but uh, here are some perks. Here's what I really like. This is where I got the title of the talk. Here are some platitudes about understanding, which is that in some contexts, understanding something apparently simple can it require appeal to something exceedingly complex? Think about understanding basic mechanics in terms of, I don't know, quarks. Uh, here's another platitude though. In under context, understanding something complicated can be accomplished by relatively simple pictures. And I wanna say that second platitude is really what captures the heart of understanding because what understanding mostly does is simplifies. Um, and I'm gonna give a little argument here. So suppose we label the minimal state of a representation, representation process pair that suffices for understanding of some object O, call that minimal state R. So for some person, either R is too complicated to be represented in their mind or it's not. If it's too complicated, then R is a simplification of O. Um, sorry, if it's not too complicated, if they can keep it in their head, it has to be a simplification because the world is really, really complicated. Um, if it is too complicated, then it can't possibly be what we denote when we attribute understanding to P and C. Um, so if we're denoting R when we attribute understanding of O to P and C, then R is a simplification of O, it has to be. The world is just too complicated. So if the world is complicated, we must be identifying a cognitive state that is about a more complicated state of the world. And this is what I think is super critical. People say that understanding isn't simplifying. I think you get this in Toolman, I can't remember. Um, because look, when you wanna understand atoms, you end up going to quarks and that's more complicated. And maybe, but the fact that quarks are more complicated doesn't mean that the content of the understanding itself is more complicated because the content isn't the quarks themselves, it's our thoughts about them which are, have to be a simplification because the world is just too confusing. Um, and it specifies what UC does is specify the way it can be simpler yet at the same time constitute understanding. Uh, so the world is made up of complicated things, quarks, moving molecules, racial tension, but that would only imply that understanding couldn't be simplifying if understanding comprised those features of the world, but it doesn't. It's about how we think about the world. So it can still be simple. Um, so I also think my view captures some connection between thought and action, and this is going to be um, not totally fair here. So understanding is sometimes measured in terms of how we think about something. I think you get this out of Kareem's book in a very extended sense of think that involves being able to think like a scientist. Uh, sometimes in terms of more action-oriented things, I think you get this out of Allison Hills. Um, as soon as we characterize understanding in terms of representation process pairs, I think we get this for free. There's what you could think and what you could do, and we need both, so that's neat. Um, the relation between abstract and particulars. Um, so you might wonder, and this is an example from Putnam that Sober, Elliot Sober picks up on, why won't this square peg fit through a circular hole? And you could give this answer that's a long description of the microphysics or pegs, or you could give this more mathematical answer, this abstract answer, look, it's a square. Um, and I think usually two is better because it gets the result that the peg won't go through on the basis of a relatively short description. It's a square. Squares don't fit in circles of similar, what would that be? It's not a radius if it's a square, uh, cross line. Um, but it's conceivable. Look, we could come up with a context where one would be better if you're trying to engage in material engineering of some sort. Um, I think we could talk about the minimal objects of understanding. They have to have a certain complexity so that we can simplify them. So if I just tell you, understand this block of text and I give you two letters, can't be done. If I give you the whole world of Juliet, I think you can gain understanding because it has structure. And if it has structure, you can find patterns. And if you can find patterns, you can compress it. Um, okay, here's just a cool example. And I think I've already got a time, so I might end maybe after this. Um, before I get to other accounts. So possibly worrisome result about understanding as compression, you can understand the Fibonacci sequence, which as you know, is just the recursive sequence that starts with zero and one and then adds up the last two digits. So here's what I think. I think this only seems like a bug because this example is so familiar and for many people not particularly useful or interesting. Um, I think if you look at different recursive sequences saying you can understand them is kind of reasonable. So. I want to talk about parent numbers. Maybe some of you know them, but I'm guess obviously I'm guessing fewer of you do than know Fibonacci numbers. 
So it's the same basic idea. You start off with initial numbers and then it's for every n, it's n minus three plus n minus two. So the next number is gonna be three, I hope. And then it's gonna be two and then it's gonna be five and so forth. So it works you know, pretty similarly. It's just a different sequence. By the way, um, but this isn't necessarily a useless sequence. And you can see that if you um, concatenate the actual numbers in the sequence. So this is, oh, you can't see where I'm pointing, the zeroth term, the first term, second term, third term. And one thing you might know is look at two, two divides two evenly, that's interesting. Three divides three um, evenly, sorry, without remainder, five goes into five, seven, seven. Um, once you get to the 11th term, it goes into 22 evenly. So all of a sudden you notice a pattern. Have we just created a way to recursively generate prime numbers? Because that would be really cool. And so all of a sudden you have the sequence, you, under, you might think you could compress it, you could learn about it, and it could do something potentially very valuable. Um, and then maybe you wanna say, look, I understand the sequence and I've learned something very deep about prime numbers, except it turns out you haven't. Um, because before you get too excited, the sequence, which seems to have this really cool pattern, breaks down on the 271st thousand term or so, um, which is also an example I love to give my kids about how math seems like you could have something that goes on forever and then it'll just break for no discernible reason. Okay, um, again, sort of lost track of time. I think skip over the cool things about classification. I do wanna talk about the value of compression, which is one, it's compressed. Um, two, understanders will be less likely to overfit their information to accommodate noise. So they're more likely to get future patterns. And this is probably familiar. If you have a lot of data points and you underfit the data, uh, you're going to be missing real structure. If you overfit the data, that's the picture on the far right, um, you're going to make predictions that are based on artifacts of the data or noise. But if you sort of get what the real pattern is, then you could probably guess better what the next data point will be. Uh, and I think there's also social value in saying, look, this is the person who understands. They're the ones who are going to say, keep going the way we think they do. They're going to use the quadratic function, which is the one in the middle, over the linear function on the left, or the I think it's a desic function on the right. And so, look, we've identified the people who are understanders of this function, which sort of gets to, I told you I'd table Vicod City and Issues. Um, and I don't take myself to have solved them, but I do think, look, we can kind of point to the understanders are the one who will go on the way we think. Okay, I said I would only get to this if I talked way too fast and I didn't. Um, I'm happy to get in the q and I think, to advantages and disadvantages relative to other accounts, but otherwise I think I should probably break there. Um, does that sound right? That sounds perfect, Daniel, and thank you so much for your talk. And once again, I get to use the applause button. Thank uh, thanks again. And um, that said, I'm uh, eager for questions for Daniel. And we have questions from David and then from Magia and then from Alex. David, please go ahead. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I, um, I'm wondering about this uh, possible counterexample. So, um, well, I, I, I kind of think your, your friend who memorized the soundness proof is, is almost a counterexample. All you need to add would be um, that the friend is using a symbol to, to, uh, to stand for the, the whole proof and a whole bunch of other facts that somebody who understands the proof could, uh, could, uh, could work out. So, you know, so you could, you, someone could memorize like a whole lot of facts more than most people who understand the proof uh, can produce, right? They just dedicate their life to memor memorizing all these sentences and then they can spew them out when you show them one bit, like a zero. And so they've compressed all of these facts into a very simple representation of a zero. You know, for them in their mind, zero means uh, they can uncompress, they can, they can unpack zero as this complex, this huge set of sentences that they spent years memorizing, but that you know intuitively they don't understand. Um, it seems like somebody could do that, but they and they so they have a very compressed representation of of all these facts for them. It's just a zero, 
or you know maybe a shiny zero. It's a very very compressed representation, but it's uh it doesn't the fact that they can uncompress they can say what it means, uh, they can spell out what it stands for, doesn't seem to confer them understanding if you know they don't really understand what they are on what the the sentences that they're unpacking themselves. Okay, that's really cool. I have to think about it a little bit. I'm trying to figure out how compressed that actually is. So on the one hand, so if you just think about it in terms of minimum description length, how long is that description? Well, it's a zero followed by a complete description of the soundness proof. So I'm actually not sure it's as compressed as you think it is. So on the one hand, um, yeah, it's symbolized in a simple way, but the actual information is all stored explicitly. At which point it seems to me like, if I'm understanding the example, it's not particularly compressed. Um, is that right? That might be right. Well, so okay, so there's something I wasn't clear about exactly how you want to measure a minimal description length. So Good. you want so um, you want to basically you want to count also the length of the program that does the the decompression. But uh, in in a normal case of a human being, you know, using uh, um, thinking as they do, right? Uh, you don't know what the program is like. Right? If you if you go look in your brain, you know, uh, uh, how long is the program? I don't know. It may be extremely long. It may be it may be longer than than the program that you know in my stipulated example. So I wasn't clear how how you would measure the length of the the decompression algorithm for um, in, in real cases. Right? Like, well, I think okay. Sorry. Come, that comes down to that. You know, I'm not, not sure that the stipulated case really has a longer program. It's a, a, sim, a, a simpler algorithm that only covers one case. So it may in fact be, you know, like the a general decompression program that works for a more complicated language with a wider range of expressions may be bigger just in virtue of that. Whereas my stipulated example may have, even though it packs in, it has an explicit representation of a lot of facts, it may actually be a shorter program. Good, but to the extent that it's a shorter program because it only covers the one case, it also will generate. So it depends what you mean by one case. If it only generates outputs for those cases, then it won't satisfy the second half of the, not equation, but function about the number of different useful outputs. Now, I guess you could say in this context, it still covers all the useful outputs. Um, I mean, there's also a second point you raised, which I think is totally fair, which is how we evaluate other people's understanding or even our own, um, which I've given you no mechanism for doing, which I admit. Um, it could be totally opaque. I'm assuming, I'm also just assuming we can make sense of things like cognition and representation and that it's not really all just, you know, Churchlandian hyperplanes in ways that will just make life confusing. Um, but yeah, I've given you no mechanism for actually assessing how much someone understands. This is to use what's I think something of a dirty word in philosophy. This was aimed more at something like conceptual analysis than a practice, a, <laughs> your reaction there was awesome, um, than a claim about, okay, I'll say explication, maybe that's, even worse um, than a claim about um, how we actually go about measuring understanding in other people. So, I mean, I think we can, I mean, as with most things, I think we could use heuristics and approximate like things like, hey, here's a logic exam, prove soundness. It doesn't always work because my friend could pass it, uh, but you could try and throw curveballs. Like, okay, question three on the exam. Um, here's a new version of disjunction elimination. It's incredibly easy to generate, if you know what you're doing, rules for a sound natural deduction system. Like uh, most of us could do that in our sleep. Um, okay, now prove that this one's sound. And all of a sudden you'll mess that person up something fierce. Um, and that might be a good way to sort of, as a heuristic measure, whether they've actually compressed useful information or just explicitly encoded large amounts of information about one particular problem set. Um, so I think there are two separate questions you're answering, and I don't know if I'm asking, and I don't know if I've successfully answered either of them, but hopefully I've at least been clear in my own head about what they are. <laughs> so uh, you think you think the person who's memorized uh, a whole bunch of facts about the soundness proof for a particular system may not be able to to give you similar facts about for with respect to another system, but that's um, 
That's, I think that's true, but requiring them to be able to kind of like um, uh, adapt their knowledge in that kind of way, that seems to be a requirement that goes beyond your account, your compression account. Yeah, it does it though. I think, I mean, it depends how we define the context probably. Um, I mean, if you very narrowly tell the context to this natural, you know, this logic exam that only has these questions and maybe they're okay, although I still have the worries about the fact that they're explicitly encoding. But if you have natural logic, you know, in Ohio State, it was 650 generally, then it seems like they haven't compressed as much useful information as someone who can do, who didn't just do the Sheffer stroke memorization. Um, I think that's right. I, I thought that the, you know, I was, I was supposing what was understood, the object I'm understanding was a particular proof in this case and, and, and okay. all contexts are relevant. That person I'm talking about can regurgitate those facts in all contexts. What they can't do is tell you about another object of understanding, but I took it that's irrelevant because oh, cool, cool, cool. You're, you know, we're, we're trying to explain what it is to understand that thing. So I, I think, well, so part of this might turn on exactly what we mean by the proof of, um, as an abstract object. If it's really just a string of symbols, if it's a string of symbols and they have it encoded in such a way, again, still have the concern that it's still all explicitly encoded. If we could get around that, um, then it's just like a picture file, then maybe they understand it. Um, that's a sort of, at that point, it's a quirky example. When I was thinking of an abstract object like a proof, it wasn't necessarily a particular string of symbols as much as a structured pattern of how you show certain facts are true, at which point some degree of malleability in terms of the output would probably be a good making feature of understanding on my account. Um, but yeah, if you think of it, forget, so forget a proof. If you think of it as like a picture file, like I just have an image of it. And then I've been, then we get into the case of, this just seems like a weird way for people to understand anything. Um, and I think I'm okay with that. All right. Thanks so much, uh, David, for your question and uh, Daniel for answering. And I'm sure there's plenty much more to debate, but there's also a long queue of questions. Sorry. So uh, no, no, this is this is terrific. This is how we get going. And uh, next up, we have Magia. Magia, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering about whether something like the underdetermination of the structural or inferential rules might not uh, prevent us from achieving understanding. And so my question is regarding the idea of, uh, okay, you have already compressed the information and you have what you think are going to be the essential points. For instance, if we go back to the example of, um, of a logical or mathematical proof, now what we have is the basic information and what we are going to try to find out are the steps that we are going to follow connecting those dots. So the rules that we are going to, to use for that uh, are going to be, in a sense, underdetermined regarding different logical consequences or different types of reasoning and so on. Um, the easiest case is something like uh, conditional detachment, for instance. It's going to be shared uh, along almost every single logic, but that wouldn't indicate that our reasoning is correct if we do something um, in a, like uh, preventing or following something like um, uh, elimination of this junction only because we have the previous rule and it's informing our, our selection of the rules that we are following. And in the particular case of our daily life, that is even more clear. So uh, the ways in which we find how to relate the, the dots that we consider to be the essential information dots um, are going to be informed by other things, not only by the inferential rules that can help us to get somewhere that we consider useful, but maybe naturalist considerations or, or things like that. So I was wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, that sounds amenable, I think, to what I want to say. It sounds like more information about the broader system that can help inform how to move from information, if I'm understanding correctly, from informational kernels to more useful information, which sounds awesome. Um, it seems like it's sort of a next level step, which is good because maybe we could get another paper out of it um, about how you take these um, much broader system systemic considerations and use those to make the sorts of inferential moves that I think are, or the sorts of moves I think are constitutive of understanding. So I think, 
I don't know if there was an objection in there. I missed it. If it was just an invitation to think about how those sorts of considerations factor into my account, I think they add a level of depth that I think is actually particularly helpful. Was there an objection? Uh, if, if, if I may just make a follow up, I, I think sure. it's I, I think the consideration, of course, is useful for your view. But if you consider the um, something that we can call like the ultimate case of understanding according to uh, to Shapiro's view, which is explaining why you decided on one structure and not on others, um, then you still have to give us something of how to get the idea of which are, is going to be at least the set of privileged structures before getting to, to the explanation of why one particular is. And that information, I don't know where is, is it going to come from. So you're talking about constructing the hypothesis space in the first place? And where that comes from, is that the question? Um, so I don't know where the information is going to come from. I don't know, I need to settle that though, as long as, I mean, I'm reading Stuart's book and I have a sense of the structures being considered um, and I understand why he chooses it, why he, well, he doesn't advocate it for that, why he advocates a particular approach to structures. Um, do I need to know I mean, I'm not totally sure I'm tracking. Do I need to know why I'm considering structuralism versus Platonism versus some type of fictionalism as the only options? I don't know if I need to know why I have those as my options. Um, that was also a weird set of options that I just gave. Um, I don't know if to know why I have those as my options, um, but I do and they help structure my thoughts. And maybe a different set would be better and help me learn more and that would be awesome. Um, and that would potentially come out in the description length, like here are my three choices. Again, weird three choices. Um, and that lets me conclude certain things. If I added a fourth choice um, or I took away fictionalism, maybe I would have different possible conclusions I could reach that would be less ultimately useful. So it's been a while since I read Stuart's book. He was my advisor, but <laughs> I'm desperately <laughs> racking my head for details. Uh, books, plural, he's written a lot. Um, Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think everything you said is actually is super helpful. Um, I think I can fold it all in in ways that are good. All Thank right. you. Thanks so much, Magia and Daniel for the answer. Next up, we have a question from Alex. Alex. With all due um, uh, concern for uh, the uh, next uh, questioner, please go ahead. Great, thanks so much. So I was, was curious about understanding without compression. And so basically kind of two things there. So, so one was this uh, response to the objection that you raised against yourself there. This is the objection that, well, don't you get understanding of something via simply knowledge of the causal explanation, which doesn't seem to involve compression. And then if I understand your response to that objection, you then considered a kind of comparison to an alternative where we're thinking now of someone else who had a bunch more knowledge that went beyond the knowledge of the causal explanation. And then we, we had the intuitive judgment that that person had understanding or at least more understanding than the person who um, knew merely the causal explanation. But it, it, so, so that all seemed, all those things seemed true, but they, they seemed kind of not, I just how they answered the initial concern because the natural response on the part of the person who raised that objection would simply be that, well, right, the uh, explanation for why that second person, I think, I think it was your wife as opposed to your son, uh, has, has more understanding is because they have more explanatory information, you know, information that the first person doesn't have. Uh, so that doesn't kind of show that compression uh, is crucial to understanding. Uh, it just shows something that's kind of, it's just an alternative explanation of that simply that that uh, you know the, the other person had just had just more explanatory information, um, and then the, the second issue on this is simply just as a kind of broader thing. I was curious how the account dealt with things like understanding in history, where like if you look at you know what historians really say, and it seems like parts of the practice, it seems often like they describe this as looking for an understanding which involves something like nuanced you know grasp of particulars of a period. Um, you know, of course, they, they use a certain amount of compression, um, but nevertheless, if they just had the compressed file, they would it would really feel that like something was they were that was really not getting the kind of understanding that they were aiming to achieve in their intellectual enterprise. And so, I was just kind of curious how you 
to have solved both those those two things. Um, okay, I'll deal with them in reverse order, I think. So the history case is, I think, particularly interesting. Um, but I think you sort of, you had the answer to your question in the question, which is that, um, I mean, it would be, there's a, the difference between history and just like narration to some extent, I would think, or at least plausibly. You're right, there's a lot of nuance in history, um, but there's also a lot of similarities. There's a lot of structure. Um, now, different historians, different philosophers of history will disagree about the extent to which that's relevant. I mean, if you're a Marxist, my account of understanding looks really good. If you're an extreme particularist, it doesn't look as good. Um, my guess is probably the real philosophy of history is somewhere in between, at which point, real plot, sorry. Just strike that from the record, pretend I never said those words. Um, a particularly uh, good way, felicitous way to think about history probably is frequently somewhere in between that you're both recognizing the nuance of individual situations, but also appreciating their connection to broader themes, at which point um, I think my account kind of works out mostly pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes the overall structure, I mean, depending on the field, the relative contributions of the overall structure of the data and the explicitly encoded facts are going to be different. Um, in the case of history, depending on how you approach history, there might be a stronger emphasis on um, explicitly encoded facts, but still some critical realm, some critical role for seeing patterns and data structures. Um, and that trade-off might, again, vary depending on how you approach history. As far as um, the, fir the first question about the objection from just mere causal information, I think what you say is probably right, but I think ties into the other objection. I think elsewhere I try to deal with, well, is just more causal information sufficient? Um, and I think there's reason to think that getting by with less is more helpful. Um, the question at that point in the dialectic was just, is it a problem that my son understands why I was late? And I think my answer was, for the most part, no, that's not a huge, and again, I think I flagged that actually is a problem. And I'm willing to admit that. But it's not as big a problem as I think it might seem, because one, he, he, at the very least, he understands very badly. And so maybe a contextual semantics will just rule it about outright understanding attributions will rule it out. Um, and two, um, that's, I mean, I don't take myself, I think what I said, to have solved the question of when mere knowledge isn't understanding. But I don't think, um, and I've been in and out, so maybe someone has solved this today. I don't think anyone has solved that. <laughs> um, so the fact that I can't draw that line, it's not obvious to me that the description, oh, my son knows why I'm late, but doesn't understand is obviously false. And if it's not obviously false, I'm just willing to take the tie and move on with life. Um, now the question of like, oh, it's just my account boiled down to more explanatory information. That was supposed to be the sort of extended, well, sure, but it's not, I don't know what type of information. It's not really knowledge. It's something representational. It's probably, you know, better if it's generative, it's probably better that that's what's supposed to be the answer to that. Why and my wife doesn't just contain more explanatory information sufficient for understanding, but there's also these other caveat, other components that are helpful. So Can I say, just super briefly, just to, the, the reason I thought the two issues were connected was because I was thinking of the following scenario. So imagine you're the historian and you, you start with like the compressed file, so to speak. But then I also think that, oh, I can increase my understanding by adding to the particularistic detail. I'm kind of making the compressed file a bit more nuanced. Right? Mm. But actually, I pop the side, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of additional detail. But if yeah. you're someone who thinks that then I'm, I'm increasing my historical understanding by doing that, I thought that was then a, a, a problem for the account because we're, uh, you know, we're, getting, we're, we're getting less bang for your buck, basically. Uh, I'm, getting kind well, of, I'm, I'm increasing understanding, but I'm not, you know, I have a, anyways. 
Um, uh, but, but, me... but, but the compressed file is the same. So, wait, is it, sorry. So you're adding information to the file, but you're getting more information out now. Good, but it's no, no, I'm, the I'm, just, I'm just adding. I was adding some like additional info about the period. I was thinking that makes it a little okay, more so, nuanced. So like flavor text. For uh, example. Good. Um, so you're adding flavor text. It increases the size of your input file. It doesn't. I mean, but it does also increase the size of the output, and that, um, but only if only in a trivial way. Does that mess with the ratio? Probably. So what you would have to say is that what I would have to say. You don't have to say anything. What I would have to say is that in that context, presumably, if you think that flavor text is important, it must be because it's also useful to get back out as output. And maybe like encoding it explicitly isn't an efficient way to do it, but it might be better than not having it at all. Good, that's what I want Thanks. to say. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Alex, uh, for the question and Daniel for the reply. Uh, I believe we have a final question tonight coming from Anna Maria Kretzu. Thanks, Andre, and thanks for the talk, Daniel. Um, so I can see the motivation for extending the account of understanding beyond science and philosophy of science and so forth. And that's all great. But I was um, extremely puzzled about some of the examples, which seem to imply quite hefty assumptions about our scientific understanding uh, to begin with and some of the kind of like developments of the account, like the, the very idea of compression itself is a deeply scientific concept. Then it talked about it in the 1991 uh, article, Real Patterns, and kind of like came up with a, well, it's a quite interesting way to think about what we do when we um, try to understand the world. We identify patterns on the basis of which we can predict things and that gives us license to explain all sorts of things or create theories or, you know, lots of things. So the examples I was in particular puzzled about were um, the ones where you're talking about kind of how children respond to pretty pictures, how children process visual images. Obviously, these two things are extremely related. Like if you, you don't have to have some um, neuroscientific understanding to know how children respond to pretty pictures, but it would certainly help. So there are kind of like interrelated connections of like, I think that my, my point to some extent about these examples and how they rely on science is that it, the, the whole idea of compressibility is that you compress the data, there are like exceedingly many patterns in the data. And for any data that you get from any kind of area of life, there are particular, um, you extract patterns with respect to a particular goal and you tolerate a particular type of, no a particular amount of noise, right? This is very kind of like the whole idea of compression again is very scientific. So um, I suppose my question is, how is this account of understanding an account that is not based on kind of like the scientific idea of, I don't know, patterns and compressibility and how does it differ to a large extent from the account of uh, Daniel Dennett who talks about kind of like the compressibility of real patterns as kind of like way of understanding the world. Okay, um, wait, there are a couple of points there. First of all, um, yeah, um, I do not claim that everything is totally original. That would be a weird claim. Um, the thing I skipped at the end, although I don't address Dennett specifically, I address Michael Strebens, who has a broadly similar, well, this is a connected view about the ability to recognize difference makers in the world as constitutive of understanding. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the central intuitions, I know of, the desiderata for the account of understanding, I don't think are necessarily all new. I think the idea under recognizing patterns is good has been around. I think you get it in unificationism. I think you certainly get it in Michael and Kara Eddick accounts. I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, and that's okay. Um, I think some of the details I developed differently. I think 
they get around some sort of technical issues and unificationism and Strevens. I don't address that specifically. Maybe that would be a cool follow up. Um, I think this account is a little bit more precise than what he says in 91, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but that's a totally fair question, which I have to get more thought about my exact advantages over him. Uh, one quick thing I want to flag, though, is I don't think I want to grant that knowing neuroscience will help me understand how to parent. Um, I think at a certain point, more information or understand how my children will react to picture books. I think at a certain point, more information not only is less compressed, but it also leads to paralysis. Um, that, that wasn't just that wasn't the claim oh. so i think like oh. the, the the claim was okay. that in knowing exactly kind of like the stages knowing about neuro um um science and knowing about the developmental stages of the children and how they for example need to play with sensory toys at three years old or things like that that is the kind of like interrelated information that to some yeah. extent is compressed and it's you know like part science part kind of like practical interaction with the real world but they're like they're, they're they're mutually informing so no i think that's so potentially that's very interesting and very helpful and it just speaks to having good more so there are a couple issues here they could have it could be getting at the idea of having sort of more robust sense of what the pattern and structure of the data are structures of the data are um which I think is okay and helpful. There could be issues, you could very well take issues with my implicit assumption that context can be neatly circumscribed. And maybe that's um, something you could take issue with. And I think that's uh, probably fair. I think if that's a problem for me, it's a problem for a lot of people. So I'm just gonna go with that. Um, that the idea of having a contextualist semantics or a contextualist anything, um, so I don't know if that's where you're going with that. Like, oh, can I really circumscribe the context of figuring out how my children will react to this picture book beyond having to involve neuroscience? That might be an issue, but I think I'm okay. Um, but the actual, the continuity between scientific theories and parenting theories and children theories and the fact that I'm using scientific work in building the account of understanding, I think I don't, uh maybe i mean i'm not seeing this as a bug this all seems really good about sort of um the continuous nature of knowledge about science in the world which i thought was a desideratum i don't remember if i listed it but i certainly think it's a cool one <laughs> uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean it necessarily as a bug i, I kind of like oh. I more or less meant it that there are extremely valuable lessons to learn about compression and real patterns from the kind of like philosophy of science literature, especially kind of like Dennett, Lady Mena Ross, Ross on its own, uh, Wallace and kind of like Tyler Millhouse has like a paper on um, compressibility of patterns in philosophy of science, just like uh, last year, I think. So I think all that literature is like vastly important, particularly because a earlier on you kind of like made the claim that um the details to some extent doesn't matter because you kind of like end up with the same compression so to kind of like put it in Dennis terms like if you have a bitmap bitmap every kind of like means of compressing compressing the bitmap would result in largely similar or similarly useful uh compressions i think that that's not something that anyone in this kind of like literature would actually uh, be fully on board with, because as I said earlier, like it really depends, like the, there are vast amounts of patterns in the data and depending on, on your kind of like goals and means of compression, uh, you will end up picking up some patterns rather than other. Depending on your tolerance of noise, again, you'll end up picking up some patterns rather than the other. So it was more like a sort of invitation to, to mm. kind of like um, see that there's kind of, there are like, there are lo lots of useful lessons to learn from the kind of like philosophy of science literature and like there, 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 there's only room for kind of like um, learning more and 
between kind of like collaborating between epistemology and philosophy of science, I suppose. Oh, yeah. No, when you put it that way, that sounds great. Uh, I'm certainly not going to object to um, the notion that there's lots I don't know in philosophy of science and epistemology. And I certainly won't object to the contention that there is room for importing and exporting to learn more. Um, if that's the claim, then I am 100% on your side. And on that happy note, we're very, very grateful to Daniel for delivering the last talk for tonight and to Anna for delivering our last question. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much once again. Thanks to all the speakers for today. Looking forward to tomorrow. Uh, please join me in um, using the applause button. Um, and Is there Sorry, is there a way for, how do I get a, to, do I watch this recording? Will it be posted somewhere? I'll, I'll definitely send it to you before I post it anywhere. Okay, oh, no, I wasn't, yeah, I just wanted to see it. Okay, awesome. Okay. Thank you so much and see you all uh, tomorrow. Uh, this will be uh, 4 p.m. local time and 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. And we begin with uh, Sogin Kostriya's talk on Russell's acquaintance. Then we have several other talks, and I'm delighted uh, that uh, several of uh, the members for today's audience include Professor Jim Cargyle, Professor Micha Dumitru, uh, David um, uh, Karim was uh, with us uh, until a moment ago, uh, so was Stephen. So um, it's quite a marathon, and we're very grateful that you've um, uh, stuck out as long as you have, and tomorrow is a brand new day filled with new talks. So thanks again, and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.